بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله we'll start with Quranic recitation by Shaykh Ali Layla. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaytanir Rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna al-lazina qalu rabbuna allahu thumma istaqamu tatanazzalu alayhimu al-malaikatu alla takhafu wa la tahzanu. ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون نزلا من غفور رحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في سبيل ربه حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم ارزيه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وتوفنا على ملته وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمع بعدها أبدا اللهم اجمع بيننا وبينه كما آمنا به ولم نره ولا تفرق بيننا وبينه حتى تدخلنا مدخله ثم أما بعد I would like to start by thanking Allah سبحانه وتعالى who made this meeting possible and we well, thank also Ayuna, our brothers and sisters who organized this conference, especially Imam Mustafa Turk for uh, inviting us all here. And I would also like to start by offering an apology to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That no matter how long we talk about him, doesn't matter how long we read his seerah, we write or we talk about him, doesn't matter how eloquent we are in talking about the excellence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we will never be able to cover even one small fraction of his excellence sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam. And I like actually um, one verse of poetry that says, إِنَّمَا مَثَّلُوا صِفَاتِكَ لِلنَّاسِ كَمَا مَثَّلَ النُّجُومَ الْمَاءُ that their depiction of your excellence is like the water surface depict the stars. There's a huge difference between the picture of the stars on the surface of the water and the real stars. So what we are talking about the Prophet ﷺ is just like the surface of the water reflecting, you know, a small fraction of what the star is. And Imam al-Busir in his wonderful Burda, Burda al-Mubarakah, Burda al-Madih, one of the wonderful verses he made in this poetry, he said, فَإِنَّ فَضْلَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لَيْسَ لَهُ حَدٌّ فَيُعْرِبَ عَنْهُ نَاطِقٌ بِثَمِي 
It says, For verily the excellence of the Prophet وسلم, has no bounds that a speaker might be able to express with his mouth. So we admit from the very beginning that we are going just to choose very few points to address from the life of the Prophet I also would like to start with a quick point that I found out that is kind of important to raise and address which is the point of the legitimacy of celebrating the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. Is it bid'ah? Some Muslims, they claim that it's bid'ah to celebrate the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. While others say or take the other extreme by saying it's a must, the wajib, you have to, you know, celebrate the birth of the Prophet ﷺ in a particular way. And if you don't, this shows that you're not really loyal to the Prophet. You don't love the Prophet ﷺ. And... After a quick research, and I found out that the conclusion is it is neither wajib nor bid'ah. It's not a must or bid'ah or heresy. It is a traditional observation and express of love. And we as Muslims living as minority, we actually ought to take advantage of every Islamic occasion to consolidate our identity, to confirm our love, to Allah, to the Prophet وسلم, and to the message Al-Islam. We need to educate ourselves to take advantage of these occasions, the hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, the birth of the Prophet Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj. We need to take advantage of all these occasions. We need to revive them and we educate ourselves as well as non-Muslims who live around us and know nothing about Islam. And I asked one of my students at Wayne State to do a research about how people look at Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and she did actually a wonderful job. A part of her paper was she did survey in the campus of Wayne State University. She in interviewed um, 60 non-Muslim students and asked them the very same question, what do you know about Muhammad? She said the majority, like 95%, they said we know nothing about him. We don't know. And few said, oh, um, he's a terrorist. Is he a, the, the terrorist that people talk about? So it's our obligation as Muslims to study, to know who Rasulullah Sallallahu is. It is shame, actually, when we see Muslim families, they don't have even one book. It talks about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Read it once, twice, and as many times as, as you can. I actually was very glad when a brother came to me and he said, you know, uh, you recommended ar rahiq al-Makhtoum, the sealed nectar, in one of my khutbas. And I did this, and I did read the Martin Link's book. And what else, what other resources do you recommend for me to read? I already have covered these uh, materials. And was looking or asking if the Ibn Ishaq book, which is considered the most authentic and one of the earliest resources that covers the life of the Prophet Sallallahu he's asking whether it's available in the market or not. And we really need to make sure that at least we have one book that we can learn and we can teach our kids. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu used to say that we used to teach our children the maghazi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the expedition, the battles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we teach them the surah of Al-Quran. Like when you teach your son or daughter, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Until he memorizes it, they used to teach them Badr and Uhud. Al-Khandaq, Fath Makkah, Tabuk, Hunayn, Mu'ta. They used to teach them these ghazawat. Because this is the practical life of the Prophet Sallallahu and the practical implementation of the teachings of Al-Quran Al-Kareem. So again, we ought to study and, and celebrate the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a positive and productive way. Study, learn, encourage, teach, remember and remind others. Introduce Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to everyone and I found two nice good points that support the legitimacy of celebrating the Prophet's birth Imam Ibn Hajar Asqalain the one who interpreted Sahih al-Bukhari one of the greatest Muslim scholars he said it is legitimate because he found one hadith in which we all know about that the day of Ashura we do fast and the Prophet ﷺ did fast the day of Ashura and he encouraged and recommended. Actually, in fact, fasting Ashura was mandatory, was obligatory before, and became sunnah when Ramadan fasting became obligatory. So he said the reason 
that the Prophet ﷺ celebrated the day of Ashura is that to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he saved Musa and the believers of Bani Israel and rescued them from Egypt to Sinai. This was the reason that Allah protected and saved Musa and his people. And he said by analogy, why shouldn't we celebrate the greatest gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us, which is the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's very legitimate. He made such analogy which is very reasonable. Al-Imam al-Suyuti, he liked this argument and he kept searching for another argument. And he found one. He found a hadith on Anas radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu did aqiqah to himself. We know the aqiqah which is sacrificing a lamb at the time of birth. It is a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu to, um, uh, to give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to slaughter a lamb or two if you want or more. Okay when you receive your child. And the Prophet ﷺ, and this tradition, by the way, is an old tradition from the time of Ibrahim ﷺ, and Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, did aqiqah. He did slaughter a lamb when the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was born. Knowing that, the Prophet ﷺ did another aqiqah to himself when he was a Prophet ﷺ. And again, to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created him, to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has chosen him to be the final messenger to all mankind. So these two arguments, or dalil if you want, that gives legitimacy to celebrating the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Surah Al-Bayyinah, number 98. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Bayyinah. And the Al-Bayyinah means the clear proof. The clear proof proof i'm sure most of us if not all of us memorize and know surah al bayna lam yakun alladhina kafaru min ahli al kitab wal mushrikin munfakkin hatta ta'tiyahum al bayna rasul min allah yatlu suhufan mutahhara fiha kutub qayyimah and this ayah or this surah talks about the importance of sending muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam the ayah says those who disbelieve among the people of the earlier revelations and the polytheists could have never departed from their erring ways until there had come to them a clear proof the disbelievers among the people of the book christians and jews and idol worshippers polytheists they could have never departed from the error from misguidance from dalal they had or they were in until a bayina, clear proof comes to them. And this bayina is Rasulun min Allah. Yatlu suhufan mutahara. There must come to them a messenger with a message. And this messenger and the message are al bayina. So the Rasul himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has to prove himself as Rasul. And the message has to prove itself. It is the authentic message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone can stand and claim prophet. And so many false prophets came and are still actually living in the 21st century. They claim that God talked to them and God, you know, inspired them and God told them to do this and that. A lot of liars around. But the proof, the clear proof is the message. So Prophet Muhammad himself is the bayina that he's he's the messenger of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and al-quran itself proves that it cannot be the production of any human being that's why we as muslims our love and our belief in our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam should be a rational belief and rational love we don't believe that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the messenger of allah because our parents taught us so because our community told us so. Because we are not, we are afraid that if we believe otherwise, we'll be punished and expelled from our community. We believe in Muhammad because it is rational belief. And there are so many clear evidence that he is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by doing that, when everything or every page in the life of the Prophet ﷺ tells clearly that he cannot be a false prophet. He cannot be a liar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's no one or two or three or five or ten proofs. Every action, every word he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, proves with no doubt that he is the chosen Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The same thing, Al-Quran Al-Kareem, we don't believe Al-Quran is the word of God because we have been taught this way. 
Al-Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Al-I'jaz of Al-Quran al kareem Some, by the way, say that Al-Quran gets its authority because Al-Ijma', the consensus, that this is the word of Allah. And this is not true. I respectfully disagree with this. Because Al-Ijma' came later on. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar al-Khattab did not believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and they did not believe that Al-Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there was consensus or ijma'. They believed in it because they listened to it. And they thought about it. And they reached the conclusion themselves that this Quran cannot be the production of any human being. Even the disbelievers, they believe that it is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they try to find some other ways to discredit this Quran. They said Muhammad is Sha'ar, he's a poet. And some other time they said he's Kahn, soothsayer. Some other time they said he is a magician or Kahn. He's a liar. Actually, before the season of Hajj, they had a meeting, as so many meetings being held these days to, you know, for professional liars to produce misconceptions and lies about Islam and Muslims. They're professionals and they do these meetings. They said, okay, the season of Hajj is approaching. And Muhammad's going to, you know, have a communication with the tribes when they come, this is of Hajj. So let's not contradict one another. Let's say one thing about him. They said, okay, let's say that he's a poet. They said, you know, this is not poetry. They said, maybe he's a soothsayer, Kahin. You know, now we know the soothsayers and we know the way they speak and their uh, bros and all these strange words they say. Okay, let's say he's majnoon, he's crazy, he's insane. He said, no, no one would believe you that he's insane. You know, he's the most wise person. If you accuse him, him of being insane, people will say, you are, you are insane. And at the end of the meeting, they said, the only thing we can see, really say that he's a magician. He produces words that separate husband from wife, master from slave, father from son, is very influential like the magicians. And the Quran talked about this. فَقَالُوا إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ يُؤْثَرْ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا قَوْلُ الْبَشَرِ This is what they said. The production of human being. So when we look at the time of the Prophet وسلم, the 6th century Christian era, there is a consensus among the historians. This was the darkest phase in the history of the human being. When the teaching of Moses and Jesus being totally changed. When the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Old Testament and the New Testament has been totally changed. People add to it and erase part of it and twist other verses to fit their own uh, evil desires. So the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disappeared. And look at Arabs before Islam. They were thinking or claiming that we are following the guidance and the teaching of Ibrahim. And we are the followers of the Abrahamic faith. And they are doing the rites of Hajj the way they believe that this is how Ibrahim والسلام, established these rituals of Hajj. And look at the huge difference between the teaching of monotheism that Ibrahim والسلام, preached and the polytheistic society, Arab society in the ignorance era before Islam. There is no hope of any agency or any movement to do any social reform there was no hope and there must have come a messenger from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that everybody would know that he is not a liar and a message that everybody would believe if he wants to believe and follow everybody will, will it will be clear to everyone this message is the message of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this when muhammad وسلم, was chosen and was sent as mercy to mankind, not only for Arabs, not only for Quraysh, not for a particular race, not for a particular geographic place. He was mercy to all mankind. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and the message, the messenger and the message, which one comes first? Did people believe or have great deal of, of trust in Muhammad so they believed in whatever he says? Or they got the message or heard about the message or heard Al-Quran al kareem So they believed in the message and by default they believed that Muhammad is the messenger. Which one comes first? To believe in the messenger 
And if you believe he's the true messenger, then you believe in whatever he says, or you believe in the message and part of believing in the message that you believe in the messenger. It happened both ways. Some people like Abu Bakr Siddiq, once the Prophet ﷺ invited him to Islam, he accepted with no hesitation, with the only person that did not hesitate or discuss or argued with the Prophet ﷺ or asked him any question was Abu Bakr. He immediately believed in him. And we know in the time of Al-Isra, Al-Mi'raj, that disbelievers came to him and told him, look at what your friend is saying. He claimed that he went to Jerusalem and he went to the seventh heaven and he came back in the same night. He said, if he said so, he is truthful. If he said so, he is truthful. And other people, they heard Al-Quran Al-Kareem without meeting the Prophet. And they believed this message is the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they came to give the pledge to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He started this movement that aimed not only to convert people to Al-Islam, but to build a huge civilization based on the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This civilization based on the oneness of Allah, Tawheedullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my dear brothers and sisters, we have a lot to offer to humanity. We have so many things to offer to humanity. We have to get rid of the self-inferiority feeling. That we are always inferior because we are under severe attack continuously. We, the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the followers of Al-Quran al kareem we have a lot to offer to humanity. That's suffering, ignorance, and social injustice, and unfairness. We have a lot to offer by introducing Muhammad and his message to all humanity. Now let me talk about the multiplicity of the character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As I told you in the beginning, I just chose some points to cover about our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What so many Muslims as well as non-Muslims don't understand is the multiplicity that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was a human being, full human being, and he's a statesman, he's a family man, he's a commander-in-chief, he's a politician, he's a social reformer, he is a lawmaker, he's a judge, he's a teacher, he's a spiritual leader, and a great worshiper to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all these things together. And for some Westerns who believe that the perfect man should be married, should stay away from women. How can you be a perfect man and getting married and having this number of wives? But Muhammad sallallahu proved that he if there is a perfect man, it should be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. It's all these things together. And when you read, like sometimes when you read one, one page of the Prophet's life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I'm going to, whatever time is allowed to me, I will try my best to show that this multiplicity of the character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One time he acted as a commander of chief. Some other time he acted as a husband. Some other times he acted as a judge. Some other time he act as a lawmaker, musharra, legislator, legislature. Some other time he act like a politician. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. All together, maybe in one day, you can see all these dimensions of his character, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Because his message is a comprehensive message that covers all aspects of this life. And he has to be the rule model in all these aspects. Some Muslims um, will get sometimes offended when we talk about the Prophet ﷺ in his home or how he deals with his wives. I was giving the other day before last Ramadan a workshop about what should we do while we are fasting the daytime and what we cannot do, you know. And when you, if you read any book of fiqh, you'll find out that, you know, how the Prophet ﷺ used to deal with his wives. Sexuality is part of our life. And Al-Quran talked about it. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the rule model. And we follow him even in these personal matters. Because the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not a private life. We know everything about his life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even, even his personal relationship with his wives. They used to come to Aisha radiallahu anha. And they asked her, Ura ibn Zubayr, her nephew, comes to her and said, I really have a question. I don't know what the answer, the fiqh question. 
husband and wife relationship things. And I'm really, I want to know, I want to get the knowledge, and in the meantime, I'm kind of very embarrassed to ask you these things. And she said, Sal Nifa ana ummuk. Ask me, don't be shy, I am your mother. This is what Allah says. The wives of the Prophet are the mothers of the believers. That's why they cannot marry them after the death of the Prophet. They're a very special case. And he asked her and she answered him. And all these th things, it's not the time now to talk about it. It's in the fiqh book if you go and see it. So I said, you know, while you are fasting, the fiqh in the fiqh books that can a husband kiss his wife while fasting the day of time from Allah? And Hadith in the Bukhari, that Aisha said the Prophet used to kiss his wife. And a, a sister came and said, Wallahi, you know what, I felt, why should we talk about the Prophet this way? We talk about him because he's our role model. He's a human being. He's not an angel. He's not half divine. He's a human being who has desires, and he put this desire in the right time, in the right place. And we, the believers, the followers of Muhammad, we have to learn these things, and we have to teach it. It's not an excuse to say that I didn't know. Go and learn how the Prophet ﷺ lived his life. Talking about Muhammad ﷺ as mercy of mankind, I'm just going to touch upon some, some uh, points of his life. at tufail ibn Amr al-Dawsi. He is one of the leaders of a tribe called Daws. And he's a poet. He's a wise person. He's a very good speaker. And people look up to him. He's one of the leaders of his tribe, Daws. He came to make Hajj, and the people, the leaders of Quraysh told him, you know, there is a, a magician, his name is Muhammad, don't talk to him. If you talk to him, maybe you will be affected by his magic, and you might lose your social position as a leader. And they made him really scared. Does this make any sense or ring any bell? Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. He's a terrorist. This, how Quraysh you know, came up with this kind of, of uh, media production to, to, you know, to brainwash the masses. Quraysh did the same technique. Or I would say they are doing the same technique that Quraysh did. And Tufayl ibn Amr Dawsi said, oh, I was very scared. And I put cotton in my ears, lest I might by mistake hear what Muhammad says. And he was doing tawaf, and he was thinking about this, and said, shame on me. I'm a wise person, I'm a poet, I know what's right and what's wrong, and I can easily differentiate between falsehood and the truth. Let me go and listen to him. And he listened to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while reciting Al-Quran. And he immediately, he said, ما هذا بالطول البشر? This cannot be the words of human being. This is not the production of any human being. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أنك رسول الله. What do you want me to do? He said, go back to your people and just deliver the message to them. He went to his tribe and he told his wife, you are forbidden. Talking to you is forbidden on me. And he told his children and he told his father, talking to you is forbidden on me until you believe in what I believe in. His household believed, but his people, the entire tribe did not believe. He came back after one year to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam complaining, Ya Rasulullah, inna dawsan asatillaha wa rasula. They disobeyed Allah and his messenger, ghalabahum al-zina wal-khamr. They could not resist, you know, practicing adultery and drinking alcohol. Ya Rasulullah, ud'u Allah alayhim. Make dua against them. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned his face to al-qibla and raised his hand. And everybody said, halakat dawus, khalas, dawus is destroyed. The Prophet will make dua and everybody knows that the dua of the Prophet will be accepted. But for their amazement, they heard the Prophet Mercy to mankind. Saying, Allah Mahdi Dawus. عليه الصلاة والسلام. He said, اللهم مهدي دوس وقت به المسلمين. He made dua to them and he told him, go back and be nice and be patient. And he came back next year, all of them embraced Islam and came as believers.
sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In other instant, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu arda, in one of the expeditions, he said, we were one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam found a baby bird and he held it and the mother or the father of this baby bird came down and throw itself in the hand of this companion to get back her baby bird. And everybody was amazed. And they went and they told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. They said, you wonder of the mercy of this bird to its baby. Wallahi, Allah has more mercy to you than this bird has towards her baby. Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. And when his son Ibrahim died, he cried, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. And he was asked, What is this, Ya Rasulullah? You are crying? He said, This is mercy that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala puts in the hearts of his people. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala will show mercy to those who show mercy to other people, the other creation of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Even animals. The Prophet said, A person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him place in paradise because he was merciful to a dog, thirsty. And a woman will be thrown in the hellfire because a cat. Talking about the asceticism of the Prophet, the zuhd of the Prophet, he said the example of me and this dunya is like a traveler who traveled and he found a tree and he decided to take some rest under the shade of this tree and then he continued in his life. I'm not interested in this dunya. And when his wives put some pressure on him, they plotted against him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said, well, now, you know, there are a lot of bounties of the war and the Prophet has a lot of animals and you no know, servants and so on. So let's ask him. So they made an agreement that every time he comes to one of you, ask him the very same question. We need you to increase our allowance. And the Prophet didn't like this. And he decided to stay away from them for a month. For a month. To the point that it has been said that the Prophet divorced all of his wives. And the reason was because they asked him to increase their allowance, to give them more. And Al Quran came down. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu kulli azwajik. O Prophet of Allah, tell your wives that if you are interested in this dunya and the pleasure of this dunya, I will divorce you, I will give you whatever you want. I cannot change my lifestyle. He cannot be benefited, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from his da'wah. And if you are interested in the life, in the life after, are interested in the pleasure of Allah and his messenger, Allah has prepared indeed for you a great reward. If you are patient and live with the Prophet the way he lives. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And he said, As-sadaqatu la tahilli li Muhammad wa la li ali Muhammad. Muhammad and the household of Muhammad cannot receive sadaqah. Cannot just to close the door, you know, in front of anyone that, that would accuse Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of benefiting from his da'wah. And if you see every Every liar, whether preacher or, or claim a prophet, that they made huge wealth. They live like kings. And preaching the teaching of Jesus, peace be upon him. Who most of the time walk shoesless, has no home, such, lived such very simple and humble life. And he said, وسلم, when the prophets die, they are not to be inherited. Whatever we leave behind is sadaqah. Whatever we leave behind is sadaqah. He left nothing, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, except, you know, his horse and his sword and his armor and some very, you know, simple belongings. And all went to a sadaqah. He is the most humble of men, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They asked Aisha about his behavior inside his house. It's very easy to, you know, pretend you are nice and kind outside. But no one would know your real behavior except your wife or your husband. They asked Aisha about the behavior of the Prophet wasallam, how he acts inside his house. She said he used to keep himself busy helping members of his family. And when it was the time for Salah, he would get up for Salah. 
He used to milk his goat, fix his shoes, and sew his clothes himself, sallallahu No one can be busy or more busy than Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet when he goes back home, he's working at home. He's helping his household, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. One of the challenges that the Prophet ﷺ met is, was the keeping the unity between Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj, or Al-Ansar, and Al-Muhajirin, who are coming from so many different other tribes. Arabs have never been united before. Everybody is extremely loyal to his tribe. This was a challenge. After going to Al-Madina, there was civil war between Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj, and the Arab tribes, usually there were kind of conflicts, and he united them, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, by the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the battle of Badr Mustaliq, Muslims were victorious, and they decided to stay to camp there for a week or ten days. But he cut it short, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because two Muslims fought over the will. There was a will, and everybody wants to give drink to his animal and things. And one who happened to be from Quraysh, and another one from Al-Khazraj, they fought over the water. It happens sometimes. Muslim brothers, they fight sometimes. But the problem is, this person said, oh, oh people of Al-Muhajirin, people of Al-Ansar, the old call of Jahiliyyah. And the other one said, oh, people of Khazraj. So now it became Quraysh versus Khazraj, Muhajirin versus Ansar. And the hypocrites were there. And Abdullah ibn Ubayb said, was the head of the leader of the hypocrites. He said, now they have done it. It's like, the old saying that feed well your, or feed fat your, your dog, eventually he will eat you. This is what we did. We embraced them, we supported them, we gave them, and look at what's, what they're doing to us now. Let's, you know, outcast them. Let's not support them anymore. He took advantage of this fighting. Not only that, he said, when we go back to al Medina, the mitre and, and higher will outcast from Medina the lower and the weaker. Meaning by the mitre and higher himself and the weaker and the lower Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa A young boy heard this and he went to Rasulullah and told him, look at the wisdom of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, let's cut off his head. Let's kill him. He said, no. Do you want to say that Muhammad kills his followers? We know that he's a hypocrite, but... You know, people count him as, as a believer. So I don't want people to say that Muhammad kills his followers. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And sometimes when we have some sort of disagreement among each other, we don't pay attention to what people say about us. We don't care about the bad image that we produce to others. We don't think of that we sometimes, we prevent people from Islam because of our bad behavior. So the Prophet sallam said, let's, you know, be kind and nice to him. And then the Prophet ﷺ ordered everyone to move on. It was the Zuhr time. Very hot. The Prophet ﷺ never marched in this time. They used to rest until it's cool and then they moved. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered everyone to march towards Al Medina. The whole day and the whole night. And the whole day, next day, until it's very hot, and then said, okay, now we can have a short rest. And everybody was just sleeping to avoid talking about this fitna anymore. And then when he went to Al-Madinah, the son of Abdullah ibn Ubayb Salul stood and said to his father, Wallahi, you will never enter Medina until you get the permission from Rasulullah because he is the mitre and the higher, and you are the lower and the weaker. He was the most kind man, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He lets go sometimes. He forgives. He offers very simple solutions to what seems to be very big problems. I'm sure you have heard about the story of the Bedouin guy who came in the masjid and he took a corner and he was urinating in the masjid. Can you imagine if it happened in one of our mosques today? Someone urinating in the masjid? فَهَمَّ النَّاسُ بِهِ لِيَقَعُ بِهِ People just went after him you know, to attack him. And the Prophet said, okay, let, let, let him finish. Let him finish. Khalas, he started it, let him finish it. And afterwards, just pour some water on it, and you'll clean it up easily. 
And he called this guy and said, you know, this is not appropriate to do these things in this mosque because this, we pray here. And he taught him very nicely and very easily. Sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. Another Bedouin guy, when the Prophet was distributing, you know, some wealth, he held the Prophet sallallahu and shaked him and said, Ya Muhammad, give me, because this is not your money, it's not your father's money. Give me more. This is not fair. And again, everybody wants to kill him. How dare you talk to the Prophet sallallahu this way? And the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, l l let me deal with him. He took him inside. And he kept giving him. And asked him, are you satisfied now? He said, yeah, jazakallahu khairan, now I'm satisfied. It could end there. But the Prophet ﷺ, the muallim, the teacher, he told him, would you please come tomorrow in front of everyone and repeat this jazakallahu khairan thing so I don't want someone to have any bad feeling towards you. And the guy came next day in front of everyone and said, Jazakallah khairan, Muhammad is the most generous man. He talked well about Rasulullah sallallahu And the Prophet sallallahu gave the lesson to his companions. By saying that the similarity with the example of this person and I is like someone who lost his camel. Some, sometimes when, you know, camels are very patient animals, but when they have a bad mood, very difficult to control. You know? So he said, this man was like the camel who whose owner lost control on him, and he kept running away. And the people tried to help him out by running after the camel. And when he feels that, he keeps going, running further and further. And the owner of this camel told them, let me deal with him. I know how to deal with him. I know how to get him back. And he got some, some grass, and he went to his camel. And when the camel saw him with the grass on his hand, he came back nicely and kindly. And he took him back home that easily. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. I would like, you know, so many things I prepared to talk about. But time is very short. Even if we have, you know, hundreds of hours. Time will also be short to, when we talk about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. I will end with this. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do ijtihad. Some believe that the Prophet ﷺ was victorious because Al-Wahd, the revelation, came to him, telling him what to do in every single step in his life. And this is not true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. Allah could have sent Jibreel with al buraq to take the Prophet from Mecca to Medina in zero time, right? But it did not happen this way. Yes, Allah supported the Prophet by sending the angel to fight in the battlefield, but the Prophet ﷺ was planning for everything. He was planning and working hard sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to show us that miracles do not come out of nothing. You have to do whatever in your capacity. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he sees you sincere in your work and you have done everything you can do then Allah will give you support and help. So the help of Allah would come after we exert every effort to be successful. In the battle of Badr he decided to camp in a particular place and Al-Hubab ibn Mundhir came, Ya Rasulullah, asked him a question. Is this a revelation from Allah or something you thought of? He said, no, there's no revelation. I thought this could be the best place to camp in. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't believe this is the best place. And he chose a different place. And the Prophet said, your opinion, your ijtihad is very good. And he asked everyone to move to the new place suggested by Al-Hubab ibn Mundhir. The battle of Al-Ahzab or the trench. He sallallahu alayhi wasallam thought of um, giving one third of the date of Al-Madinah to one group of the enemies of Al-Islam. 10,000 people came to attack Al-Madinah. Ghatafan itself, 4,000 people. So he thought sallallahu alayhi wasallam that I will give one third of the date of Al-Madinah to the people of Ghatafan so that they go back. So it will be easier for us to fight against 4,000 than 10,000. And by the way, this idea, this idea came to the Prophet ﷺ after a very bad news came to him. Just imagine, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, they dig the trench, they are sitting in one side, and the disbelievers, 10,000, standing on the other side. They try to cross the trench, and Muslims have to push back, and yeah, they have to throw and shoot arrows to push them back. And Bani Quraidah, the Jewish tribe, were in the back of Al-Madinah, the south of Al-Madinah. 
And the news came to the Prophet وسلم, that the Bani Quraiza broke their covenant. They broke their agreement with you. And now we have another enemy on our back. 10,000 people on the other side of the trench. And now Bani Quraiza in their back. So the Prophet sent some of his companions to figure out whether this is true or false. And they came back to the Prophet and they told him, it's true that they broke their covenant with us. Ibn Hisham says the Prophet in this critical moment, what, what, what do you think was the reaction of the Prophet? He covered himself with his cloak, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like this. Covered himself. He spent some time. And I asked myself, what did the Prophet sallam, do in this time? Why did he cover himself? What, what was, he, was he sleeping? Of course not. Was he praying to Allah or was he thinking? And I guess he was praying and thinking. Sallallahu There was no reveal. Jibreel did not come telling him what to do. So he stood up. And he said, Abshiru ya Have a good news, O Muslim. Inshallah, we'll be victorious. And then he called Sa'ad ibn Ubadah and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, the two leaders of Al Aws and Al Khazraj, leaders of Al Ansar. And he gave them this idea, suggestion, that is not revelation. It is not revelation. That they give one third of the day to Ghatafat. And Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh said, Ya Rasulullah, is this a revelation coming from Allah so we don't discuss it with you? Or this is this something you want to do for us? He said, no, it's something I want to do for you. Look at the answer of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, we were ignorant people. And Ghatafan and Quraysh had no hope to eat our date except when they come to us as guests, we offer them food, or they come and buy our date. So now, after we follow you, and after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with Al-Islam, we give them our date, Wallahi, we'll never give them anything except the sword. In such politically weaker position, the Prophet was thinking, and the Sahaba showed this great deal of strength and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they learned from the Prophet And the Prophet smiled and said, Abshiru, Allahu Akbar, inshallah, will be victorious. So he's always promoting hope, optimism, as long as you are following what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do. And as long as you are doing everything as a human being, then be sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with you. My dear brothers and sisters, in the time of injustice, inequality, in the time of violation of human rights, polytheism, and atheism, in the time of absence of rule model, we Muslims need to properly introduce Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to the world with confidence, with knowledge, and honesty. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who truly and sincerely follow the footsteps of Muhammad we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take our soul when we die as Muslims. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us with our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa jazakum khayran.